after World War II, the problem in Europe is seen to be the world's great dilemma. Europe's problems brought about World War I, then its unresolved problems, despite the idealism of the Treaty of Versailles, brought about World War II. Europe's been fighting itself on and off for as long as the Romans, uh, since Roman times, and before Roman times. How do we solve the problem of Europe, the problem of nationalism? The answer is some form of European Federation, Confederation, Federal Union, or Union. Winston Churchill, during his time out of power in the late 1940s, became a hero on the European mainland for making speech after speech to the peoples of former Nazi-occupied Europe, advocating the establishment of a United States of Europe, a Europe unified along somewhat like American lines so that you would not have fighting between French, Germans, Brits, Italians, Spaniards, Poles, Russians. A United States of Europe. Within the constraints of the Cold War, that would be a United States of Western Europe. Now, the European countries after World War II were going to change. The British Nationality Act was not the only uh, thing that is going to change the ethnic balance and the cultural uh, balance of Europe. European countries are going to embrace social democracy, which is socialism and democracy like a Reese's peanut butter cup. A relatively free economy, but highly taxed and regulated and womb-to-the-tomb, cradle-to-grave social welfare benefits. So the need to work and the incentive to work is much less in a social democratic welfare state than it is in the United States. And the need to work is always something that helps immigrants assimilate. They have to learn a language and function as employees or they starve. So in America, our melting pot is built by the fact that every immigrant who comes here has to get a job and support their, themselves and their families. There's no welfare benefits for immigrants back in the day when we had large numbers of immigrants in the 17, 18, and early 1900s. But another part of social democracy is birth control and abortion on demand. So the birth rate in Europe, which had been fairly normal, New generations outpace the old, and all modern economies are based on a somewhat growing population, begin to level out. And some European populations even begin to decline. The economy requires new workers. So the economy requires an increasing population. But Europeans are having fewer and fewer kids. What to do? Oh, I know. What we'll do is we'll bring people in from the French colonies, like Algeria, into France, and, and we'll bring people in from Turkey and other Middle Eastern countries to work in German industries and German factories. And uh, they won't really be French or Germans. They'll be guest workers. Guest workers. Uh, they'll work for our economy. They'll make a good living. They'll be able to go back home rich, be able to send money home. Uh, most of them are going to be men, unattached men, uh, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll kill two birds with one stone. We'll help enrich our neighbors in the Middle East. We'll help teach them some European ways, and we'll get our economies working with our lower birth rate. Oh, this is going to have consequences, just like the British Nationality Act did. We'll come back to that. On the European unification idea, when the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is established in the late 1940s, all the countries of Western Europe that join, along with Canada and the United States, are under America's nuclear umbrella. If the Soviets attack one, they attack all. An attack on one is an attack on all. So Europe's militaries 
are subordinated to NATO needs and the NATO High Command, which is run by Americans. And Americans and Western Europeans have to agree on a common caliber for their rifles, which they ultimately agree is 5.56 uh, millimeter, which is a mouse round. But uh, anyway, right. talk about that some other day, year, whatever. Uh, we agree on rifle calibers. We agree on 9 millimeters as a pistol caliber rather than the U.S. 45. Uh, but our militaries are going to be fused. And this is going to reduce the chance of European countries fighting European countries because everyone's part of NATO. And besides, the Soviets are growling at the door waiting to see any sign of weakness, which is going to encourage Europeans to cohere around this unity idea. Finally, in 1956, at the Treaty of Rome, something... Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Back. 1950, just after NATO. <clears throat> French Foreign Minister Schumann, German name, French Foreign Minister, gets his dream project, the European Steel and Coal Community, off the ground. If any materials are needed by European countries to wage modern war, it is steel and coal. And Schumann's idea is to prevent another German attack on the rest of the world by turning the Ruhr industrial region and Krupps and the other industries that deal with steel products under international control. By bringing them under international control, <coughs> Germany will no longer have the Ruhr to build its next war machine. Germans in the Western German Federal Republic agree, the rest of Europe agrees, and suddenly steel and coal is no longer part of your national economy. It is controlled by the ESCC, the European Steel and Coal Community, for the benefit of all Europe. The Ruhr is no longer run by Germans, even though it's in Germany and inhabited by Germans, it's run by the European Steel and Coal Community. This is a step towards the 1956 Treaty of Rome, which is going to establish the European Economic Community. Now, at first, Britain is involved with these negotiations. And the idea is that Europe will become a big free trade zone where there are no tariffs. It'll be like the Zollverein or the Hanseatic League. It'll be very profitable. And that the EEC, the European Economic Community, will be all about reducing barriers to trade. That's what Britain wants. But the Anglo-Saxon, English-speaking tradition of personal freedom and liberty and free market economics is not the tradition of the French and Germans. They are much more comfortable with a Roman Empire-style command economy. Or, and also with this social democracy thing going on, where the societies have a free market, but heavily shackled by regulation and taxes to pay for womb to the tomb care. What the mainland European countries, particularly Britain, particularly France and Germany want, is they want a European economic community that acts like a super government regulating the economy of all of its members. What Britain wants is a free trade zone with very limited powers over international trade. The French and the Germans and the Italians want a super government that's going to take over and run the economy of Europe for the, for the benefit of all. When the British realize that this is the way things are going, um, they say, we're out. We're not going to be a part of this. We're not going to be part of this new European Economic Community, or EEC, or the Common Market. And the other countries say, well, that's a shame, but we're going ahead. And France doesn't even say that's a shame. The French are just as happy. The French have a giant chip on their shoulder because of what happened in uh, 1940. And any chance that they have to stick it to the Americans or the, or the British, uh, they take uh, out of this sense of whatever they have, animus, that comes from the Merzik Kabir uh, destruction of the French fleet by the British, and more than that, by the fact that France had been occupied by the Nazis and the Maquis were run by the British, that France owes its freedom to Britain and America, not to itself. That just drives them nuts! In any event, so the European economic community starts out without Britain. Britain and the rest of uh, the outer fringe of Europe, 
including particularly Scandinavia, is interested, it sets up a competing trade federation. But in the end, <clears throat> Britain wants in. The British want in to the economic union because the winds of change are sweeping across Africa. The loss of the British Empire and the destruction of the Commonwealth of Nations idea as something that's real and economically valuable means that Britain is losing its trade partners. So Harold Macmillan, Prime Minister of Britain, who says we're getting out of Africa, begins establishing negotiations for Britain's entry into the European economic community. But France at this point is ruled by Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle was the head of the Free French. He was very difficult to deal with. In fact, the Americans wanted to get rid of Charles de Gaulle. Churchill was willing to go along with it. And Harold Macmillan personally saved de Gaulle from being gotten rid of. And de Gaulle knew it. So Macmillan does a series of, agree of meetings with de Gaulle. Now, de Gaulle is a unique figure in French politics. After he, he basically is given credit by patriotic Frenchmen for saving France. After World War II, he washes his hands of politics and goes into retirement. And so he's not stained by what happens in Dien Bien Phu or by the ongoing revolution against the French in Algeria. De Gaulle is drafted to become a new president in the late 1950s to solve the Algeria problem. De Gaulle doesn't run, but he allows his name to be put into consideration if he can have a new constitution that gives the president real power and not just as a figurehead. So de Gaulle is responsible for the Fifth French Republic, which is a French Republic that still is in existence that has a strong presidency. And de Gaulle is going to be this strong president. So de Gaulle has a massive influence over French policy. De Gaulle betrays the people of the Frenchmen in Algeria and withdraws France from Algeria, giving Algeria its independence causing several assassination attempts on him. De Gaulle famously meets with Macmillan. Macmillan at several points is in tears and is begging De Gaulle to let him in. De Gaulle says, I'll tell you on television. So a great television event is, um, is organ orchestrated at the presidential palace. De Gaulle walks in and sits down in front of two little microphones, and I may include this as a video too. And de Gaulle starts talking about les Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the English-speaking peoples are maritime. We continentals are, are, are land-oriented. The English-speaking peoples are flighty. We are, we are land-oriented. Continentals are organized. And, and he goes into this back and forth. So the question is, should we allow the British, these Anglo-Saxons, to come into our European Union? No! And the satisfaction in that no is palpable. He gets his revenge for France's defeat in 1940, for Britain not being defeated, but in fact winning World War II with America and Russia. Britain's out of the European economic community. And uh, this is where we will leave things uh, into the 1960s.